So hello, everybody. Welcome to FBLA, and thank you so much for coming. This is our second ever speaker series. Uh, my name is Goldie Beck. I'm the chapter president of Heritage and FBLA. Uh, before we even start this interview, we want to invite you all to press the view button and turn this interview into spotlight mode. It'll just make it an easier process. You can see our faces, or you can stay in gallery mode. Up to you. Uh, so, uh, my name is Neha Danwada and I am the events officer and coordinator and uh, today Goldie and I will be hosting today's event. So our goal in FBLA and with this speaker series is to inspire the next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs and we could not think of a better person to do this than the one and only Marla Beck, the founder and CEO of Blue Mercury. Uh, Blue Mercury, just for a little background, is a luxury cosmetics retailer founded in 1999 in Georgetown. Um, Marla and her husband, Barry, um, grew the business into a national beauty chain, um, scaling the company into hundreds of stores around the country and multiple product lines before selling uh, the business to Macy's in 2015. So without further ado, here is Marla Beck. Introduce yourself. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. It's always fun uh, to talk to high school students and um, hear what they're interested in and what they want to do. Um, so super excited to be here. Uh, you know, I um, grew up in California, came east uh, for graduate school, uh, ended up in Washington, D.C., which is where I am right now. I'm actually in Bethesda, Maryland. and. Um, started Blue Mercury with my husband, Barry, uh, when I was 29. Um, so um, many, many years ago, 21 years ago, and I'm just excited to be here and um, hear your questions and, um, you know, have an honest and frank discussion. Yeah, and this is a reminder. So we'll be talking for 30 minutes and then we open the floor to you guys. So while we talk, kind of brainstorm your own questions for Marla. We hope we can get to them. So Marla, uh, can you give us a background on your early experiences in high school and college after college that set you on your current career path? Yeah, um, so, you know, my dad was entrepreneurial and had never gone to college, um, but uh, had an insurance company and a real estate development firm and used to put me to work in his office in the accounting department uh, when I was in high school. And accounting is a really good way to learn about business. Um, back then, we didn't have computers or Excel spreadsheets or any way to add numbers other than with a calculator and by hand. And so I literally had to balance the bank accounts by hand to the penny every month. Uh, that was my job. Um, so I think I was exposed to the guts of business at a, at a pretty early age. Um, and then I went to Berkeley for college and studied economics um, and joined a business club different from FBLA, um, but was incredibly valuable. It was called ISEC. They still have it in colleges. And we used to find internships for foreign students. For every one we found, we would send someone abroad with an internship. So that meant we had to go to companies and ask them to take interns they had never met. Uh, so I learned sales at a pretty young age. So at Berkeley, we would go into San Francisco and I would go to the headquarters of The Gap and say, hey, will you take an intern? And we, all, we got a lot of no's, but we kept going to different departments until someone would say yes. Um, so I would say accounting and sales is great experience uh, for business. Uh, and then I went into consulting um, with a company called McKinsey after Berkeley. And consulting, what you do is you help businesses solve their problems, they ask you. Uh, so as a young 22-year-old analyst, what you do uh, is you do a lot of research um, for, for the companies. So for example, there was a power company that wanted to build plants in Asia. So we would go research, you know, which markets in Asia were best for them. Um, so consulting was a great foundation uh, for ultimately starting a company also. Gotcha. So then with all of that experience and, you know, accounting, which sounds very appetizing, um, <laughs> what eventually led you to start Blue Mercury? Where did the idea come from? So when I was in business school, um, a guy came to speak um, at a speaking event. Um, there were 30 of us that showed up. This was in 1999, uh, actually 1997. 
Um, and he was explaining the internet to us and e-commerce. We had just gotten our first email addresses. So imagine that there was no Google, no Yahoo, no e-commerce, nothing. And this guy came in and was explaining what e-commerce was going to be. And um, he um, talked about how he was going to sell books on the internet. Um, so this was Jeff Bezos. His company was just two and a half years old and he completely started to change my worldview. And so I went into finance after graduate school, which is where I met uh, Barry, who's my husband and co-founder of Blue Mercury, a serial entrepreneur. And he kept saying to me, well, why are you working in finance for someone else? Why don't you start a company? So the two of us started looking for ideas to start an e-commerce company since it was the beginning of the internet and e-commerce and everybody was starting e-commerce companies in the late 90s and we wanted to be part of that. And back then beauty products were only sold at department stores and drug stores. They were not online and they were not in freestanding stores. So Blue Mercury started as the first beauty e-commerce company. We were the first to bring brands like NARS to the internet. Um, However, we were too early. Nobody was shopping on the internet yet. Um, we, were, we joked that all the e-commerce uh, people were just buying products from each other to see how it worked, um, but we really didn't have very many customers and uh, it wasn't easy to dial up. Um, now, you, you know, we have Wi-Fi and everybody complains that the Wi-Fi is down for a minute. Well, dial up, it used to take a, you know, like 30, 40, 50 seconds, you'd be waiting to dial in and then you'd get kicked off. And so it wasn't that convenient to stop shop on the internet back then. So we were a little early, um, but I think, you know, what we did and the lesson is we found a new industry that was just developing. And so as you think about, if you want to develop an idea, it's really helpful to go to a new sector or something that hasn't been developed yet than to say that you want to do, you know, the next coffee shop, right? How many coffee shops are on the street? So thinking about what's new and what's next is great because there aren't any rules. And so when we started Blue Mercury as a beauty e-commerce company, there just weren't any rules. Um, and so that enabled us to get going. Gotcha. So a lot of young people, young entrepreneurs do have these ideas, but they don't know how to take the first step toward action. What was your first step? Were you getting coached on this first step? Um, well, you know, I was lucky because Barry had started other companies before, so he knew the basics about incorporating and starting a company. We went about it a different way than I would suggest today. So today, it's really easy to test, right? You can build a little website, start a blog, you can do a little test to see how your idea is working, how people respond to it. Back then, it cost almost a million dollars just to build a website, you didn't have Wix, you didn't write. So you didn't have these convenient tools to test ideas. And so we went about it a different way, which is we had an idea, we put together a PowerPoint plan and then we just went out to people we knew and raised money. So our first step was raising money. That's harder today. Most people, their first step is a little bit of a test of the idea using either a blog or doing a prototype and testing what people think. Um, so I would say if I were going to start something today, if I had an idea to sell something or, um, you know, to start a media company, you know, you can post something on Medium, you know, and see if someone responds to it, right? So there are more options to test ideas today. Um, so very different from the way we did it back then. Uh, so uh, as you, as um, we've mentioned before, Blue Mercury has been around for almost, you know, 20 years. Um, how do you feel Blue Mercury has changed over the course of its existence? You know, I think uh, clearly we changed from just a pure e-commerce company. We opened our first store in the first year because we were too early for e-commerce. And so we had our first e-commerce site, we had a store and we slowly expanded stores across the country. So we're almost at 200 stores. So that, that's a big change. I think the other thing is we've started launching our own brands uh, in 2012. Um, so we have M61 Skincare, which is a clean clinical vegan skincare brand. And we have Luna Naster Cosmetics, which is a vegan cosmetics brand. And so we started launching our own brands and that's also a big change. Um, 
And then we've done since COVID, you have more changes, which is we do a lot of master classes now for our customers, a little bit like this, but we're teaching about makeup or doing conversation series with our founders. And so COVID has brought the next generation of some of the things that we're doing. Uh, so you mentioned um, M61 and Loon and Aster. Uh, can you just go into a little more about how what led to that creation and what was the inspiration behind it? Sure. Um, so M61 we started because we had clients coming in saying, I love the natural skincare brands, but they don't really do anything to my skin. They don't make it glow. They don't take away acne though. They don't have any impact. Uh, and we had other clients coming in that say, said, um, I love, you know, the, there was all of these doctors and dermatologist brands, but when I look at the ingredient list, they're full of chemicals. So I don't want chemicals in my brand, um, in my skincare. And so this was the merger of these requests from our clients, which was, you know, can I have an efficacious natural brand, uh, but that also has the impact that some of the dermatologist ingredients have without the chemicals. So M61, there's lists of 200 chemicals that can't be in the brand. It's vegan, it's clean, it's paraben free, uh, no animal testing, it's synthetic fragrance free. Um, and so we've really pushed the boundaries of having a brand that is powerful, but doesn't have all the things you wouldn't want um, in your skincare. Um, and so it's a good um, example of how when you have a company, if you listen to what your clients are saying, they tell you what they want. Um, so listening is really, really important if you're going to innovate and create something new. And then Loon and Aster came about much later. So we launched Loon and Aster in 2015, uh, mainly because we didn't have a paraben free or vegan mascara in our store. It was driving me crazy um, that, that we couldn't find a vegan makeup line because we had a lot of clients asking for that. Um, so that was the reason we launched. Um, and the other reason we launched Luna and Aster is because makeup and all of the steps were getting really complicated. And we found that our clients just wanted easy steps to get them out the door in the morning in 10 minutes or less. Uh, and so we say sort of, you know, Luna and Aster is vegan, good for you cosmetics that get you out the door in 10, 10 minutes or less. It's makeup in minutes. Um, so once again, we were listening to what the demand was in the marketplace and we didn't, we carry other people's brands in our stores and we couldn't find one that met the needs out there. And that's when you find innovation is when you hear what people say uh, and what they want, but you can't find a solution. Gotcha. Now, um, so before COVID-19, I'm sure COVID-19 brought a new array of challenges, but what were the biggest challenges you were struggling with with Blue Mercury? You know, uh, what were we struggling with? I think, you know, the marketplace got more competitive because you had companies like Sephora and Ulta expanding next to us. Um, so I think that was a challenge. The other challenges, our stores were full and we wanted to launch new brands for, that our customers wanted. There are so many beauty entrepreneurs every day. And so we really had to figure out how to find space for new brands um, because there's always new innovation in the industry. Uh, and so I think two things, we aggressively expanded to meet our competitors. Uh, and then we also really did an evaluation of all the brands that we carried, what was working, what wasn't, and got a lot quicker at changing in and out brands. And that's really been a strategy for the past couple of years is how do we quickly launch new products, new entrepreneurs, and um, grow them or um, you know, scale them in a way that um, our clients can constantly try new things. So, and then how has um, Blue Mercury grown during COVID? Like what's next for Blue Mercury now? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So we shut down all 200 locations, which is not great for growth. Um, last March, April, May, brought them up in June again. Um, but what happened, which is interesting, is our internet business exploded. So we always had a great internet business, but all of those clients that, shopped in store, then came online and got used to shopping with us online. And so that business grew really aggressively last year um, and has held, and now we've opened our stores again. 
Um, you know, the hardest thing is that people don't go in and ha try on makeup anymore, right? Because we used to, you know, our staff, beauty experts used to put makeup on people and help them try it or help them try the texture of skincare. You just don't do that anymore. Um, so that's a challenge that we're facing and trying to figure out how you use AI more to have, help clients see how makeup could look on them. And then we're still doing video consults. So you know our clients will contact us and say, can you do a Zoom call and teach me how to do my makeup for an event? So something that we've never done before. Um, so, and then as we grow, you know, we'll add a couple of stores here and there. Uh, we'll continue to launch new products. We've been really launching a lot of new products in N61 and Luna and Aster. And then we added over 60 brands to the stores um, in the past six months. And so that's been really fun to do. Um, and a lot of diversity of the founders and um, really promoting that has been phenomenal. Uh, so, uh, I just, we just wanted to know, um, uh, like, what do you feel is Blue Mercury's impact on the entire beauty industry? And what legacy do you want Blue Mercury to leave on said industry? Yeah. Um, I think we are the first and only to re really figure out how to do friendly neighborhood stores at scale. So you walk into our environment and the staff are friendly and they help you and it's very low pressure. Um, and I think it's a soothing shopping experience. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we have cultivated, you know, hundreds of entrepreneurs over the years and helped them grow their businesses. Um, so that's really important. And then the third thing is we've really given our beauty experts a place to develop their management and leadership skills and be promoted through the company. So, you know, someone who may have started as a beauty expert 10 years ago now runs, um, you know, a big piece of the country for us. And so really developing and helping people lead. Uh, our company is 93% women, um, which is not that common. Um, so that, that's the final part of our legacy. Right. So uh, in other interviews, you've mentioned that you have mentors who give you business guidance and tell you how to take the next step, um, just like your husband Barry did back in the day. Um, and you have champions who actually give you the stepping stone opportunities and put you in the room. Yeah. Um, who have been some of your mentors and champions and how they helped you through, throughout your career? Sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, Leonard Lauder, um, who is um, the son of Estee Lauder and built the Estee Lauder company to what it is today, uh, walked into Blue Mercury within the first year. Um, and we pitched him on us carrying a bunch of his brands. And he said, not yet. Um, but over the years, he's been both a mentor and a champion. So he's given us advice and created new opportunities for us. Um, so I think that's been uh, significant. Um, I think over the years, if I look at sort of when I was in high school or when I was in college, which is where you guys are, um, you know, there my math teacher in high school always gave me new opportunities, um, you know, to try new things. And then in high school, I had an economics professor um, that really gave me a lot of good advice and helped me apply to business school. So my piece of advice to you around that is take take opportunities to get to know your teachers and professors. Um, because they want to help young people find their passion and calling. So it's, it's a good thing for you guys to do to go to office hours, whether you're in high school or college, um, and um, really tell them what you're looking for or what you want to do, and they will open doors for you. Um, so uh, what's another piece of professional advice uh, that uh, you have kept with you throughout your career? Yeah. Um, you know, really taking micro opportunities and seizing micro opportunities, which is, you know, you may get a call from someone, maybe it's a founder of a new brand that's just starting out. Um, and you want to take that call because you never know where that may lead. Um, great example is the first, um, just the, the, uh, conversation or the speech that Jeff Bezos gave when I was in graduate school, 
not many people showed up, but for me, that really altered my thinking. And so really taking those micro opportunities to experiment and meet new people and try something new. Um, one example is I think when one of my daughters was a sophomore, someone asked her to lead a workshop and she was panicked because she had never led a workshop. And so she, you know, practiced and tried it and was incredibly nervous. Um, but now she loves leading workshops. And so, and that was just because she tried the first time. So taking those opportunities to try something new, I think is the most important. Yeah, so you do, you have three kids who are all ambitious and maybe you're the one giving them that advice. You and Barry, what are some of those tips that you're um, telling your kids, professional advice, personal advice? Yeah, we have, a, we have a couple mottos. One is work hard, play hard, right? We, you know, we expect everybody to work hard. If you don't work hard, you can't make progress. Nothing comes easy. Um, so I think that's one. Two is uh, if an opportunity is both terrifying but feels kind of amazing, you should try it because if something's terrifying, it means if you do it, you're going to learn something. Um, so take those terrifying opportunities because what's the worst thing that will happen. And then I, I think the third thing is failure is inevitable. Uh, it's going to happen. So you have to embrace it and learn from it. Um, you know, I, when I was in high school, um, I didn't even make the JV volleyball team. We were volleyball players because we were um, in California. And I went to the coach and said, what do I have to do um, to make the JV team as a sophomore? And she told me um, just steps I needed to do, try, you know, play an outside team, you know, work out all these things. So I made the JV team the next year and then became captain by senior year. So that was that was a huge failure. I was devastated when it happened. But when when you have failures like that and then you achieve later through hard work, that's the best way you learn. If you're successful all the way along, um, you don't really learn that much. Um, so it's okay to fail and embrace failure because you may end up on a different path. Yeah, and I think I'm always wondering this. You're a parent, you're a CEO. How are you, how do you balance this time? How do you de-stress? Like what's kind of a day in the life where you find relaxation, fun, but also fulfillment? Yeah, um, you know, in the morning I like to run or walk um, and read the paper, right? And I try to use the morning for thinking. Um, so I may do some product development work on Lunar and Aster. I may look at the numbers from the previous day. Uh, and then I try to book calls in the afternoon. So I'm on Zoom like this all afternoon, every day. Um, and um, before I used to travel, right? Go visit our stores. Um, go to New York and meet with some of the creators of the makeup line. So now everything's Zoom. So when I visit our stores, it's like this. When I meet the makeup founders, it's like this. So um, so I tend to be, um, you know, uh, in the afternoon on Zoom a lot. Um, but I do like connecting with our beauty experts and the people in the field because they see so much. They see the customer and I learn something every day from them. Um, so, um, and then in terms of day in the life, um, you know, uh, COVID has been interesting. So the kids are around, so I get to have lunch with them. Although now that they're starting to go back to school, um, you know, I, we catch up on the evenings again. So it's a little bit different, but it's been fun for the past year, even though they're not so happy to be home all the time. It was kind of fun for me to spend a lot of time with them. And I think most parents would say that. Um, so beyond, you know, the advice that you gave earlier about going to office hours and talking to your professors and also just taking, uh, every opportunity you can get, um, do you have any important skills that you think on young entrepreneurs should have, they should possess, they should employ? Yeah. I mean, I, I think developing analytical skills to look at numbers is really important. Um, I had that training, not meaning to, um, in high school, but also um, I learned Excel um, pretty early um, when it was new. And I think that was helpful because now, even now I use those numbers analytic skills. And it doesn't mean that you need to be a computer scientist or anything like that to look at numbers, but um, developing those analytical skills. 
public speaking and knowing how to sell, uh, because if you're an entrepreneur, you are always pitching what you're doing or trying to convince people about your vision. Um, so I think those skills are super critical. Uh, and then, like I said, being comfortable with failure, right? So really being okay with it, because um, that's how you will grow and develop. Um, so I, I think that's a really important thing. And then a piece of advice that a college professor gave me, um, she told me to be an expert at something. And so, you know, developing an expertise so they can say, well, uh, you know, you're a really good interviewer. Um, and so people know what your strengths are, developing that expertise in something, um, as long as you're interested in it, um, really um, helps you find your way. Yeah, so in FBLA, we spend a lot of time thinking about what it means to lead, how to be a good leader. If you walk into a Blue Mercury store, every single person from the manager to the makeup artist, you know they love to be there, you know they're working toward a mission, maybe they're not talking about it, but they all kind of have this unity of they're working towards something. How do you inspire your employees to reach toward that mission, even on the days when they're tired, you know, everybody has this camaraderie and inspiration. Yeah, so our mission's always been really straightforward. It's the same mission today as it was 21 years ago, which is to be the best at giving beauty advice. So we always say, you know, when, if you get tired about of unpacking inventory or, you know, mopping the floor, right? Because if you're running a store, there's so many different things to do. Just bring it back to the product and start chatting about, you know, what are your favorite new products? And um, because if we're all educated and chatting about what we love and why we're in the industry, um, that really keeps us focused on why the customer comes to us too. Um, so it's really about talking about what's important to us. Um, so that is really my job now that the company's um, much larger than the beginning, which is to make sure we're keeping our DNA of friendly expert on a service and being the best at giving beauty advice. All right, I think we've reached the fun round and then we are going to open this up to all of you for questions. So first, Marla, you will have maybe one or two words to answer for each of these questions. It's just a rapid round. Um, You're assuming I'm quick at that, I don't know. So. I know, I'm hoping that some of these you might have to consider, there's only a few. Okay. okay, first, just about beauty. What's one beauty trend you wish would make a comeback and one that needs to be eradicated forever? You know what, I, um, I miss having my makeup done. I, you know, even though I'm in the makeup business, it's such a luxury just to have someone else do your makeup or try things on you. So for me, I hope that makes a comeback someday because that's an absolute fun thing to do, especially if someone's really good at it. Um, a trend that I wish would go away. Um, gosh, that's hard. Um, I have to think about that. Uh, you know, I don't know. I think, you know, I actually don't know. I'm going to come back to that. So I can't even. You're diplomatic. You're taking a diplomatic approach. Yeah. Uh, um, what is your one must have uh, product that's carried up Blue Mercury? Everything I'm else that, is on. This is the only thing that you can have. That's easy. Power Glow Peel. It's our top product. Um, you know, it's great for fine lines, wrinkles, acne, you name it. Uh, the girls use it when they have pimples. So uh, it's just, it's our number one product in the store. Um, do you ever secretly use drugstore beauty products? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I do not. I, you know, first of all, you know, I'm a diehard. So if you ask, you know, I use Lunanaster makeup or M61 skincare, I created it. So if I'm not using it, it's a problem. Um, second of all, you know, everybody's sending me stuff all the time. I have closets and closets of stuff. Um, so I, I'm advantaged like that. I will say um, my teenagers do. Um, so I'm always watching what they're using because um, I'm fascinated by it. Um, but I do not buy drugstore beauty products. Okay. Uh, so if Blue Mercury weren't a cosmetic store, what would it be? Um, so I, I said it shouldn't be this earlier because it's too competitive, but I love the cafes. Um, and that's another thing I miss is getting my coffee in the morning and hanging out at the cafe and maybe grabbing coffee with a friend. So some sort of hangout space that um, friends could meet. Um, that's sort of what I miss the most right now. Um, you know, if it were my kids, they'd say a candy store. This family has a really big sweet tooth. Um, so yeah. 
All right, I th so those were the rapid round. Great job, only hesitated for a few. Uh, we're opening with questions. Our first question just came in uh, from Harrison Zuritsky. What are your top three most influential business and self growth books? That's a very good question, Harrison. Um, I do love the Steve Jobs book. Um, it's fun to listen to. Um, you know, he was a visionary in terms of product development and really seeing what everybody wanted before anyone else could imagine. I mean, the iPhone's the perfect example. Who could have imagined that? Um, the other is um, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight of um, Nike, because um, he really talks about the start of Nike. Um, so really the first couple chapters of the start, you get a feel for how hard it was, because this he started Nike a long time ago, it was to start pre-internet. There was no technology um, and how ruthless some of his competitors were. Um, so I think that's a really good, um, book about how to start. Um, you know, I love um, Kara Golden's new book. There are a couple of new books by female entrepreneurs that I think are really good. Um, she's the founder of Hint Water. Leslie Blodgett has a new book um, called, I think it's Pretty Smart. She was the founder of Bare Essentials, a cosmetics brand. So I think there are a lot of female entrepreneurs writing books right now that are, that are quite good also. Um, so but thank you, Harrison. Um, and everyone else, if you have a question, feel free to use the raise hand feature and then we'll put you up here on the spotlight or you can chat us in a question. Okay, from... Olivia, I'm going to butcher your last name. I'm so sorry. So Olivia Ergener, as someone with a business background, how did you learn so much about makeup, especially when creating your own brands? How do you work on the formula chemistry side of the products? Um, that's a great question. So I was always a makeup junkie, but it was more of a hobby, makeup and skincare. Um, there, there were a lot of um, young companies in Berkeley, which is really close to where I grew up also while I was growing up. Um, so there was one called The Body Shop, which is not the body shop that we know today. Um, the body shop actually took the idea from this one company. Um, and they used to make their own formulas right in Berkeley. So I was always kind of obsessed on the side. It was a hobby. Um, so, and when I lived in Boston, it was really hard to find cosmetics when I moved East. Um, you know, I used Mac and Mac was at one store in all of Boston. And so I used to drive 45 minutes to go get Mac. Um, so I think I just knew about it as a hobby. Uh, and so sometimes I never thought I would be in the makeup business. So sometimes your hobby becomes your career and, you know, you never know. Um, and then um, how do I develop formulas? Um, so I work with a couple of chemists. Um, and I come up with an idea. Um, and I think I've been an, around the business long enough to know exactly what I want. And then we work and work and work to make it. I think when we launched M61, uh, you know, the chemists, uh, we were breaking new ground and the chemists said, you, you can't take all these chemicals out and still make a good product. And so we pushed and pushed and pushed until we got there. Um, but, um, and in terms of where ideas come from, sometimes they come from customers. Sometimes, you know, they're just ideas from other um, industries. Um, and so the ideas are coming from everywhere. Uh, from Matthew Moscow, is it hard giving equal attention to every store? Uh, of course it is, um, but we've built a whole structure to do that. Um, so, you know, 10 stores report to one district manager, um, eight district managers report to a regional director. Um, maybe it's more now, actually, I think it's more. Um, so we have a whole structure so that everybody feels like they're getting time and attention. And then we actually can use Zoom now. I mean, we always had Zoom, but Zoom makes it great for training and quick discussions. I think we had almost every store manager on, on the phone two weeks ago to talk about, you know, our plans for spring. Um, so yes, it's hard um, to make sure that the um, culture and DNA and everybody feels touched and important, but easier with technology today than it's ever been. Awesome. Um, okay. 
We have one from Ms. Marcusen. So how do you decide which product line to add or subtract? And how do you decide within which geographical areas you sell? For example, there are different lines in stores in the local area that are only five miles apart. Yeah, um, it's a great question. So um, first of all, we have a whole team that does that. So I don't make those decisions anymore. I mean, sometimes if the team is unsure, they'll come to me. Um, but um, in terms of launches, it's a combination of realizing we have gaps in categories. For example, we may need a new fragrance line or a hair care line or um, you know, a vegan hair care line. And so we have a list of categories we're looking for products in. And then we're always meeting with founders of new companies um, that want us to carry their brand. So it's a combination of knowing what you want, but always doing constant meetings. Um, the way you evaluate is usually, you know, the num the sales per store and whether it's viable given the amount of shelf space it takes up. And then uh, we listen a lot to our staff about what they think the client wants. And so, you know, it may be a slightly different mix at stores. It may be just space. It may be um, what the staff is saying that the client's asking for. It may be that we choose a store that's really strong in makeup to test a new makeup line, but the store down the street is not as strong in the category. So it really, there are a lot of um, components that go into a decision. And I would say some of it is analytical and some of it is um, really an art. Uh, so from Stuart Beck, uh, when you started the company, what were some of the obstacles you encountered and how did you overcome them? In particular, store site selection, investor resistance, reluctance of vendors to supply product and the likes. Yeah, I mean, the first year of any entrepreneurial venture is really hard because you're trying to build every part of it. Um, so, I mean, the first thing is we almost ran out of money, which was not great. Um, so that was hard. So we learned how to really conserve money. Um, site selection, um, you know, where we put stores is really, really important because you can be on one side of the street and there's less foot traffic because the sun may not shine there in the afternoon. Uh, or you have other stores next to you that your customer likes to go to. Um, so uh, choosing where you put a store is one of the most important things anyone who has stores do, does. And so what we did, especially back then, and we still do, is we go sit and observe how the clients walk down the street and what kind of clients are shopping where and which stores are busy and which stores aren't. Um, so that took a lot of time. Um, investor assistance. Um, some investors are helpful and some meddle um, and give you bad advice. Um, so, um, you know, that's always tricky to balance. Uh, you know, it's just an example of that, you know, the first year, especially everything's really, really hard, um, but then you get the hang of it. So the site selection easier now. Um, we know more what we're doing, um, but we still go through the same process. So, um, I think you, you learn a lot as you go along. So thank you, good question. Uh, so from Jack, what surveys, if any, were used to create your products? It's a great question. We do not use surveys, which is, um, you know, kind of business entrepreneurship 101 today. That being said, we, um, didn't launch our own products till the company was, you know, 13 years old. So we had, we had data of what people were purchasing. Um, so we knew the categories. And then we also really talked to a lot of our staff and have, we have them test, you know, samples of new products we're creating. So it's almost like our surveys are internal with our teams um, since they know what the clients want. Um, but when we first started, we did not do surveys and they do teach you today in startup methodology to do surveys, so. Okay, from Oren Elder, how is running a successful business different than what you initially thought it would be like? Um, great question. Um, I was running a, I, I'll take away successful because some days you're successful and some days you're not. Um, you know, I think there's a lot more about managing people than I ever imagined. I think I'd come from economics and strategy and the more 
technical side of business. And honestly, a lot of it is motivating people, developing relationships with people, um, whether they're inside or out, um, bringing people onto your mission. And so the people part of business um, was um, more intensive than I thought. I think that's one of the main differences. And it honestly is all the time, right? You're always recruiting new staff. Um, you're always making sure everybody un understands the mission. You're always trying to connect to your customer. So the people and the relationships part of business is the, the part that I didn't probably understand so much. Um, so from Emerson Carl, oh, sorry, this is actually Annie Newmark. How do you decide which marketing strategies to use? It's, that's an interesting question because when we first launched, um, it was really straightforward. Everybody just um, did PR with the magazine. So you would go talk to the editors and they would put your new products in the magazines and that was it. So today, you know, there are so many channels, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, um, you know, Pinterest, Facebook. And so I think we're constantly experimenting with all of the different channels and the, um, success of each channel is also changing all the time. Um, so, you know, a lot of times you use a metric right now called return on ad spend. So how much revenue I do I get per dollar of uh, advertising I do? Um, and that is evolving now to return on ad spend over your gross margin dollars. And so everybody's starting to look a lot more closely at ad spend return per product. And so I think that's changing. People are getting more technical, um, but we're always experimenting all the time. Okay, this is just the fans want to know. Um, please ask in all capital letters, what is your skincare routine? Mm -hmm. Question. Um, so um, at night I wash my face with um, either Power Cleanse or Brilliant Cleanse, two of our M61 cleansers. Um, I tend to use a peel um, and then a vitamin C product, whether it's Vitablast C serum from M61 or uh, our Vitablast C 20% cream. Um, and then I use in the morning, actually, um, Luna Naster are primer before I put on any makeup and the Luna Naster CC cream with SPF 50. So do wear your SPF every day. Um, so that's my simple routine. Uh, if I have time, I'll do a mask or do something fun. Um, or um, and certainly if I have blemishes, I'll use, we have a power spot treatment for blemishes. Um, so um, good question. I'm always experimenting though. So sometimes I'll completely destroy my skin by experimenting with new products. Um, so then that's not, that's not good. So. Right. Uh, so from Robert Zuritsky, uh, how do you determine what is a valuable retail location? Hmm. Good question. Um, you know, uh, I think it's really about traffic and co-tenancy, which other retailers are there. Um, so that's the key. Um, so for example, we're, I believe in Ardmore, which is close to you guys, right? Um, so if you think about that, that has a lot of foot traffic or had, you know, I don't know, with COVID things are changing. Um, there were a lot of great retailers um, that, you know, so people go to Starbucks and then they might, you know, go get stationary at one of the stationary stores or, um, you know, get, go get tennis shoes or, you know, you know, there are stores where people are shopping and then realize they needed to pick up makeup or skincare. Um, so you have other retailers. Um, we do look at a place like um, Ardmore, how's the parking, right? How are people getting there? Um, you know, we like that people would also take the train home from the city um, and after work, maybe stop in before they went home. So you're looking at a lot of factors, but it all comes back to the same thing is how many clients are going to come through my front door and can they get there easily, right? So that, that's what we look at. All right, this one, I'm gonna double up the question, both about Macy's. First for Ms. Marcusen, how did you know it was time to sell Blue Mercury to Macy's? And then as a follow-up, how has being acquired by Macy's um, allowed you to attempt business strategies or ideas you previously could not? Sure. Great question. So um, I think um, we started getting calls from companies that wanted to buy Blue Mercury, including Macy's. 
Um, and uh, when we thought about it, um, we were we wanted to expand more quickly. That was what we wanted. We wanted more resources, more money to expand more quickly. And so we had 60 locations when Macy's acquired us. Uh, they gave us money and to expand to almost 200. Um, so that was a huge benefit. They also, we were also building everything in the company from scratch, all of our software to manage the distribution of our products, um, all of our financial systems. We were really um, trying to build the entire organization. And so we were able to use their resources um, to, to build those um, assets more quickly. Um, the, we also though negotiated that we would be separate, a separate division. So sometimes when a company acquires you, they lend you in and you don't have your own identity anymore. And so that was really important when we looked at who we wanted to partner with. We wanted to be able to have our own division and our own autonomy uh, and negotiated that ahead of time. Um, so that was really important to us. So I think it's been successful because we were able to grow really quickly and we launched Luna and Astra actually. At, we had the idea before um, Macy's acquired us but launched it right after. Um, so those resources were helpful also. Uh, so let me just pull up the next one here. Um, how has your life in Blue Mercury affected your life as a parent? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think I started Blue Mercury before I had kids. So the kids sort of grew up with Blue Mercury. Um, they all have store numbers. So our oldest, who's almost 18, was store number five. Um, you know, our next one, who's a sophomore, is store number uh, eight, and then our son, who's an eighth grader, is store 12 through 20, so they have store numbers associated with them, um, and we have pictures of them unpacking inventory at new stores, so we really blended everything together, um, so I think, um, you know, they, they know about stores, um, they know about how you connect with customers, they came to our client appreciation parties every year, and so I think the way we did it is by blending. And that's one of the benefits of being an entrepreneur. You could control your own life a little bit more. Um, there's no one telling you you can't bring your kid to work. Um, and, you, you know, they can't unpack inventory um, and do, do things with your company. Um, so um, I think, you know, the impact has been I've gotten the benefit of being a working parent uh, and blending it all together. Uh, from Jason Dichter, if you could have changed one thing about how you grew your business, what would it be? Um, maybe I would have grown a little bit more quickly earlier um, because um, I think we were the first with the freestanding specialty store idea in the country. Um, Sephora wasn't in the country when we started and Ulta was really small. So maybe I would have grown a little bit more quickly earlier. Um, but the rest, um, I wouldn't change anything. All right, I think our next one, um, Olivia, how did you come up with the name Blue Mercury? Uh, we made it up, so I love the color blue and we wanted something strong and fast to go with it. So this was pre-Google, pre-Yahoo, pre-search engine. So Barry went to Barnes and Noble and started looking through the thesaurus on the shelf and came up with Mercury, which is the god of communication. And so we're about communicating with our clients. And so we just made it up. Awesome. And or an elder, looking back, so this is similar to the growth one, but what is one thing you would have done differently? Um, I'll try to come up with something else. Um, I'm trying to think. I think the first year I would have been more cautious with how much money we were spending building the company because uh, I don't think we really knew it was going to run out. And so I think when you build an entrepreneurial business, you should try to spend as little money as possible. Um, just a reminder, you can also use the raise hand feature if anyone's not camera shy. Um, okay, well, one of our questions was how do you um, like split between Barry and you, like your responsibilities? How did you figure out which jobs you preferred to do? Um, yeah, I mean, we, 
we were we did a lot together the first couple of years, but then we found we were better at different things. So I spent a lot of time on the merchandising and the marketing and product development and with our staff and building, you know, our relationships with our clients. And he spent a lot of time on the operations and finding new stores and finding resources. So he would find, you know, the chemists for us. He was, he's really good at finding new resources. Um, and um, that's how we split. He ran the office. I love to be in the stores with people. Um, so um, we, we really had different skill sets um, from that perspective. Um, so, um, but we did at the beginning, the first five years, um, go to all the meetings with the new makeup brands together because we always found um, we have very different personalities. We always found they liked one of us at least. So if we had both of us in the meeting, someone would like one of us. So it's helpful to have a partner when you go to meetings because you never know who's gonna connect. Awesome. Uh, could we get Max Beck on the stage? Here. Hi, you. Hello. Hello. Hi, Max. I have a question. Um, so what are your thoughts on the subscription economy, uh, which generates about five times more rep revenue growth compared to typical retail? And it's sort of sweeping uh, the nation this past year with the pandemic, um, especially in the cosmetics industry uh, with Birchbox and Dollar Shave Club, to name a few. Um, has Blue Mercury ever tried to explore a subscription business model? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And so the subscription model people really like because you're getting a surprise every month. Um, so it's an interesting business. It's very hard to get to profitability. So you have to have a pretty big business to get to profitability, which means you have to have the capital to get to scale. So um, so I, th I think it's a, it's a great business. Consumers really like it, but you have to be willing to lose money for a lot of years while you build it. And so uh, I think for us, we do have subscription for some of our items, you know, um, and then we are exploring doing subscriptions with M61 and Luna Astor because we're, when you control the brand a little bit more, it's easier um, to get to scale. Um, the interesting thing about subscriptions is during downturns, um, people turn off their subscriptions right away. So a brand like Rent the Runway, I don't know if you've heard of it, they do yeah. subscription clothing. What they found was that, um, you know, when, the, when COVID hit, people didn't need clothes anymore to go out. And so they just turned off those subscriptions. And then I had another friend um, years ago who did a recruiting, um, subscription so he would help you find jobs and people would actually cancel their credit cards during downturns and so you just have to be aware i think it's a point you have to be aware of the business model you're in and how it works and how much money you need to build that um, so you can manage around it so i think we've always been really clear at what we're good at and when we try something new like for example we go try to try subscriptions We'll test it to see how it works. Um, so, but people do love subscriptions. It's, it's fun to get something in the mail. Thank, Thank you. you, Max. Uh, I think Brad Garber had a question. Brad, come on to the stand. Hi, um, how do you emphasize sustainability at Blue Mercury? Yeah, no, great question. So we have a new conscious beauty program um, where uh, we have a bunch of different categories that the brands fall into, whether they're organic or packaging sustainability or vegan. And so um, online, you can tell, you know, which of our brands fall into our conscious beauty platform. And in stores, we have a conscious beauty section. And so we really think a lot about that. Uh, we are looking more, I mean, the cosmetics industry generates a lot of waste, right? Because you use your shampoo bottle you know, hopefully you recycle it, but not everybody does. And so we're really thinking about how we can aid the recycling of beauty products long-term. And that's one of our initiatives. Um, you know, when we manufacture our own products, um, you know, all of our boxes are wind powered, uh, like for M61 Luna Astra made with wind powered electricity. Um, we really look at um, sort of how we're, um, buying and looking at our packaging and but we're continuing to try to innovate um to be as as recyclable um as possible 
Thanks, Brad. Um, from Kendall Johnson, what are three characteristics that you think a good leader should have and or develop? Yeah. Um, first of all, you have to have the confidence to set the vision for the company because when people look for a leader, they want to know what the vision is. Um, second, you have to listen a lot um, because your customers, uh, your staff, um, everybody's full of ideas um, and have a lot to contribute. Um, and third, you have to be a really good decision maker. Um, people look to leaders to, to either make decisions or guide decision making. Um, and so you have to be comfortable if you, you know, want to wait forever to make a decision, it doesn't help people move forward. Um, so I think those three things are really, really critical. I have a follow up to that. So have you developed like kind of wisdom, like how you make decisions personally? Have you developed like a toolkit? everybody has a different way to do it. I mean, um, my nature is really analytical. Um, so I tend to ask what the data says, um, if, if there's data around it. If it's a decision that is, there's no data, I try to think about what the right thing to do is. Um, and then I have a rule, if I don't know what to do at all, I don't make a decision. So if I really don't know the answer, I try to figure out what, what I would need to know to, to make the decision. Awesome. Um, we have from Angelina Tsao, what are some things you hope for Blue Mercury to achieve in the future? Yeah, I think um, it's a good question. I think we don't have the brand recognition um, that uh, we should given our store count and given the services our staff provide. So that's one thing we're really thinking about. Um, you know, there are a lot, we had a lot of ideas for new brands to launch besides M61 and Loon and Aster pre COVID. Um, so they're on hold. Um, so I hope we can bring out those new product ideas. Um, you know, during COVID, you had to back off how much you were spending on new innovations. Um, and then I hope that for the long term, that our DNA of friendly, expert, honest service in a neighborhood store environment, whether it's online, through Zoom, or in the stores, um, uh, stays forever. All right, we have another question from Harrison Zeritsky. Are you pursuing any new companies? Um, yes. Uh, uh, no, I just, as I was reading that. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so yes, I started a new company on Monday, which is called a SPAC. It's called Bright Spark Capital. You can look it up. Um, taking a company public, so I can't really talk about it. But yes, I did start something new. What have been the effects uh, in Blue Mercury in the background? Um, as you know, you've announced that you have stepped down as CEO. Well, I haven't stepped down yet, so don't eliminate me yet. Um, so um, now I'm transitioning through June. Uh, you know, I think um, I'm really proud of our teams. You know, there are a lot of people that have been with us for 20 years, 15 years, 10 years. Um, so I think um, it's bittersweet to leave everybody. Um, but I told them I'm never really leaving. So. Um, but um, I'm an entrepreneur at heart, um, so it's time for me to start something new. Our final question, where do you see the beauty industry going in the next 10 to 15 years? You know, I think it's going to move more into wellness and health. I think, you know, the last 20 years has really been about giving people confidence, um, and that's how we've looked at it. So I think before that, it was about glamour past 20 years is about confidence. And I think the next 20 is really about wellness and health and um, uh, really thinking through how that links. So I think you'll see more science and technology and beauty, right? Can we alter our DNA, you know, to change, um, you know, how, how fast we age. Um, so I think there's going to be, a, you'll see a lot more science and beauty. Gotcha. So thank you so much, Marla. Uh, this was awesome. I know I got a lot out of it. We want to thank all of you for listening. Uh, we hope you learned something about leadership, entrepreneurship. That's our goal as FBLA with this speaker series. Look out for us for our next speaker. Thank you, Marla. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Great questions, guys. Great job. Awesome. Great job. This was so thank awesome. you.